Hi, my name is Kelly Aitken. I'm the Business Development Officer for the Digit Me Too project, which is a European Regional Development Funder project based at the University of Central Lancashire's Burnley campus. We provide up to 150 hours of fully funded support to help Lancashire-based manufacturing SMEs adopt Industry 4.0. Our team specialises in data visualisation, data analytics, IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things, as well as robotics and automation. This video is part of a series of videos designed to give you a more detailed insight into each of these subjects. Please contact me using the details on the screen to discuss how Digit Me Too can help your company. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Richard Kenyon and I'm one of the project engineers on the Digit Me Too project based at Euclid Burnley. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about the industrial internet of things, give you a brief introduction, overview and a couple of examples. So let's get started. So what is the industrial internet of things? Well, the concept comes from the internet of things, which is the concept of having smart devices. It might be your thermostat, fridge, your phone, car, camera, all sorts of things. And having these devices be able to talk to one another through the cloud. Now the cloud, for anyone who's not familiar, is basically the concept of having computers which you don't have to own yourself. So they're provided as a service by Amazon or Microsoft. And the way that it works is that you essentially buy time on a machine to do whatever calculations you need to do. This connectivity to the cloud allows everything to behave in a more intelligent way. So, for example, you might have a thermostat that learns to predict when you want the heating to be on and turns it on for you without having to be asked. The industrial internet of things, abbreviated as IIoT, is the same concept applied to an industrial context, so that rather than having a fridge or a phone, your smart devices might be sensors on the machine or on the vehicle. For example, you might have a fleet of vans that keeps you up to date on where they are. IIoT comes under the umbrella of Industry 4, which, for anyone who hasn't encountered the term before, is essentially the use of data-driven techniques to improve and enhance manufacturing. IIoT is well suited to the data collection aspect of this, and you can have a collection of devices recording data on various aspects of your production environment. The data that's recorded is sent up to machines in the cloud to be fed into a data analytics system, and then the outputs of that system can be used to inform your decision making. I believe another video from the DigitMe2 team will be covering this. It's also worth mentioning that the concept of data logging does overlap with the data output that some industrial machines are capable of, although the specifics of how this is implemented might be different. So, I briefly talked about the Internet of Things, which leads to the question of, what is a thing? Fundamentally, it's a networked device that communicates with the cloud, as I mentioned previously, and typically it does this either by using a protocol called MQTT, which is the more normal approach, or by using other web services. I'll talk more about MQTT in a moment. The device itself might be as simple as a small temperature sensor with a network connection that's just capable enough to report how warm it is every five minutes. Or it could be something more complex, perhaps a control unit for part of a machine that provides a telemetry output. It might just transmit the data straight away, or it might do some edge processing on it first. Again, I'll talk more about the concept of edge processing in a moment. And as it mentions on the slides, the devices do operate in business environments, so they need to be able to work in a secure manner because they do effectively open a factory up to the outside world and you don't want them to be leaking any important data. As you can see, there's a lot of variability in what an IoT device might look like. The key feature is that they can communicate. I've really only talked about sensor systems, but it is worth mentioning that it does go both ways and you could theoretically send commands and data to a device if you wanted to. So what is MQTT? It's a machine-to-machine -machine communication protocol that's designed to be lightweight and to be able to be implemented on small systems that have a limited amount of processing power. It's based on the notion of publishing messages and subscribing to messages that are published. Devices communicate with a single entity known as a data broker. This data broker sits at the centre of a network of devices and typically it will be running on a server in the cloud. So this might be 
as a service provided by Microsoft Azure, for example. You could also run the data broker locally on site if you want to keep control of all the data and make sure that nothing leaves. The data the broker handles is organized by topics. These are formatted into levels and you sub can subscribe to a specific topic such as the factory data, paint shop, air temperature, which would give you the temperature of the air in the paint shop, as you might expect, or you could subscribe to a more general level. So you might ask for all of the sensor data from the paint shop, which would include temperature of the air, humidity, the amount of time that the paint gun has been used for, that kind of thing. Equally, you might have data from other parts of the factory, so you might have factory data, machine shop, sensor information, or information from the warehouse, for example. So, devices can either be publishers or subscribers, as I mentioned earlier. Publishers would connect to the broker and publish data onto topics. The topics are used to categorise the data. So if you want your humidity readings, you publish to, say, factory data, paint shop, humidity. And then devices that want to make use of the data, say, some data analytics package, would subscribe to the same topics and the broker will send them the data as it becomes available. The last point to mention is that MQTT includes what are called quality of service levels, or QoS levels, numbered 0, 1 and 2. These equate to increasing levels of robustness. So if a client specifies a QoS of zero when it subscribes to a topic, this means that there is no attempt to handle messages being missed. Each message gets one shot at being delivered, and if it doesn't get where it's going, then so be it. A quality of service of one means that the client or broker, depending on which way the data is flowing, will continue trying to send the message until it gets an acknowledgement from the other end that the message has been received. This ensures that the message will eventually get there, but it does mean that they can be duplicated, particularly on a noisy connection. Finally, a quality of service of two uses the most complex handshaking system and is used to ensure that a message will be received once and only once. You'd use the different levels depending on whether or not getting a message once and only once is more important or whether you want speed. So if you've got something which is outputting a reading every few seconds, you might not be bothered about missing a few, but you want them to get there promptly. Now, on to the edge processing I mentioned earlier. Edge processing is data processing that's performed on the device, the thing, before the data is transmitted. The name comes from the fact that the device sits at the edge of the network. Typically, edge processing might be used to make the data more compact and easier to transmit. Now, while this concept is simple enough in theory, I feel it will benefit from an example. So here's an example. Imagine that we have a vibration sensor attached to the side of a machine, recording the vibrations. A vibration sensor is basically an accelerometer, so what we're really measuring here is the acceleration of the sensor back and forth. It's taking readings at 1 kHz, so that's 1,000 samples every second. The graph on the left shows you the pattern of vibration. Now, we could just send each and every reading to the data broker, but a thousand messages a second is rather a lot to ask. So what we can do instead is use a fast Fourier transform, an FFT, to turn the data into something more manageable. So we start with our sample vibration data, and what the fast Fourier transform does is that it allows you to pick out the frequencies and amplitudes that make up a waveform. I won't go into the mathematics of it here, but there's plenty of information available online for anyone who's interested. We start off with a one second sample of our original vibration measurement in green and break this down with an FFT into its components in blue, red and yellow. The numbers defining this are on the chart on the right. It's worth pointing out that this won't actually allow you to reconstruct the vibration data at the other end as the phase information of the component waveforms is lost. All that we're interested in is the frequency though, so in this case this is fine. The processing that you do will depend on what information you care about and best of all, because this is the industrial internet of things and the devices that are processing this data are inherently online, if you decide at a later time that you want to push out a software update and change the edge processing that's been done, you can do. Anyway, after doing some number crunching, what we've done is that we've got the initial list of a thousand readings down to just a few numbers that mostly represent the same data and more importantly contain everything that we want them to. Transmitting, in this case, six numbers is going to be a lot easier on the network to do once a second than transmitting a thousand readings. 
which makes things easier for the network, it makes it easier for our device as well, and generally just makes things easier to handle. The last point that I wanted to mention is security. I mentioned this briefly earlier, but it's worth going over it again. IIoT devices do effectively open factories up to the outside world, and they make a lot of real-time data about them accessible, because the intention is to be transmitted up to the cloud, which obviously isn't on site. It can be if you want it to, but if you do that, then you have a lot of extra management tasks to deal with and you lose the benefits of the cloud. MQTT does allow for encrypted communication already, as do the web standards that support it, so it's something to keep in mind when you're looking at buying devices more than anything else. So I've talked about what IIoT is and I've given you a brief introduction to the main concepts. That's all well and good, but the bigger question is always going to be, so what is it used for? Collecting data is a little pointless if it isn't ultimately used for something, so a few examples. One common use of it would be condition monitoring, so this could be the ambient environmental conditions I mentioned earlier, process variables, basically anything that you can get a sensor for. If you can record data about it, there's no reason why you can't stream it out to the cloud and make use of it. A more specific example, however, and I believe one of the earliest examples of IoT style sensors was monitoring the condition of oil pipelines. This started out as sensors that were monitoring thousands of miles of pipelines to make sure that there were no cracks or leaks and grew into a network of sensors which monitor road and rail tankers, barges, all of the equipment that handles the crude oil and then communicates all the sensor readings over LTE broadband, so effectively mobile data and allows things like flow rates, temperature, pressure, everything that the oil is doing to be monitored and the general health of the equipment. This allows for safety monitoring, predictive maintenance, all sorts of benefits like that. Other examples might be smart tools that can report the condition they're in and how they're being used. So for example you might have a power drill that can record the level of charge in its battery and you can keep an eye on that, so if the battery's starting to deteriorate, you'll know to replace it. Or perhaps an angle grinder with a vibration sensor on it, so you can monitor the vibration that it produces for safety reasons. You might also use stock management devices to track the movement of stock and work in progress around your factory, and give you an idea of when you'll need to order more, rather than having to do a manual stock take or you could look at continuous monitoring of your production process. This will give you an idea of, say, whether or not your forklifts are driving a lot further than they need to back and forth every day, or helping you work out how to best organise your work in progress based on how long the paint is going to dry in that paint shop that I mentioned earlier on a damp, cold day. Things like this can be fed into a continuous optimization process to keep improving the efficiency of your factory. So that concludes this video. Again, my name is Richard Kenyon and I'm a project engineer at DigiMe2 based at the Burnley campus of the University of Central Lancashire. If you have any questions about this video and you'd like to get in touch with me personally or if you're interested in working on the project with us, our contact details are on the screen now. At some point in the future, I'll be doing a video of a practical example of setting up a small IIoT system just to show you how easy it is to get started. That's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.